Being a single mom is hard, very hard. I hate my job. I have a slew of late pickup charges from my son's daycare and my body has gone fat from years of fast food dinners and alcohol abuse. Every day is a struggle. My mind is a prison cell and I lost the key to the door so long ago that I don't even care to look for it anymore. That is why when I won a trip to Disney World through my company's annual raffle, I nearly cry tears of joy. Nothing good ever happens to my son and I. The list of our misfortunes are as long as my arm, and this just provided us with the one thing that we thought we would never recover, hope. Hope not just for a fun week, but hope that maybe the perpetual muck that has overtaken our lives ever since my husband left us five years ago would finally start to dissipate. You can imagine my horror then when I lost my son during the final day of our trip. We were making our way over to Space Mountain when suddenly I had to use the restroom. I told my son to sit on a nearby bench while I did my business and then disappeared into the first clean stall I could find. When I exited the restroom a few minutes later though, he was gone. Fear gripped me as I whirled my head around the scattered crowd, trying my best to locate him before he wandered out of sight. My efforts were futile though. I spent the next five hours scouring the park in a panicked frenzy. No matter how hard I looked though, I couldn't find him. Just as I was about to call the police, I found him sitting on the bench that I had left him on earlier that day. He was wearing a full body Mickey Mouse costume, and I would have walked right past him if I hadn't recognized the worn out Scooby Doo backpack resting on his knees. I ran over to him and wrapped my arms around his head. His body was limp in my arms. If it wasn't for the steady rise and fall of his chest against my thigh, I would have thought he was unconscious. Where have you been? I swear I looked all over Magic Kingdom for you. And where did you get that Mickey Mouse costume? He didn't answer. It was at this point that I became concerned. My son is normally very talkative. It was unlike him to be so reserved, especially after such a traumatic event. Why don't you take off that mask? I want to see that you are okay. I reached down to pull off his mask, but he swatted my hands away with such force I staggered back a step. Never before had he hit me. The blow surprised me so much that I stood there, motionless on the sidewalk, for almost a minute, unsure of how to respond. Eventually though, I regained my wits and sat down on the bench next to him. I know you are scared, I said, but everything is alright now. We're together again. You're safe. Once again, no answer. Why aren't you talking to me? Are you hurt? No answer. I tried for several more minutes to get him to respond, but I might as well have been talking to a mannequin. All he would do was sit there unmoving on the bench, staring off into the distance through his mouse eyes. The only time he would move was to swat my hands away every time I tried to remove his mask. We sat on the bench for over an hour before I grabbed his hand and led him back to our hotel room. Luckily he didn't resist as I maneuvered him through a crowd. To my surprise, he followed me with dog-like docility and even allowed me to tuck him into bed that night, Mickey Mouse costume and all. I debated that night whether to contact the park authorities about his disappearance and stolen suit, but decided against it. My gut was telling me that I should, but I was just too exhausted to prolong the matter. He seemed relatively unharmed for one thing, and we had to get to the airport by 6 the next morning. Calling the authorities would potentially extend our stay, and I couldn't afford to buy another pair of plane tickets. So, I kept the matter to myself and drifted off into a light sleep the moment my head hit the pillow. We arrived home around sunset the next afternoon. My son still wasn't talking and continued to swat my hands away every time I tried to remove his costume. At this point, my concern skyrocketed. Not only was his behavior so bizarre, but he hadn't eaten or drank anything in over a day. Unless he was sneaking food and water while I wasn't looking, he had to be on the drink of dehydration. I decided to take him to the doctor early that next morning. Something terrible had obviously happened to him while he was missing, and 
I felt like a failure of mother for waiting so long to get him help. When we arrived at the doctor's office, he threw such a fit that the nurses had to restrain him. No matter how hard they tried to remove his mask though, he always found a way to counter their efforts. It was as if that thing was plastered onto his head. Eventually, the doctor became so concerned that he decided to do an x-ray. He told me that it was the quickest way to assess his health through the costume and that they would devise a plan while the x-ray process to remove his mask. I thanked him for his help and then watched as they escorted my son into another room. The doctor returned a few minutes later. His face was so pale, I feared that he might pass out. We finished the x-ray, he said, voice shaky. Thank goodness, I said. Is he alright? The doctor stared at me for almost a minute without responding, hands shaking. Is something wrong? His head and spinal cord are the only parts of him underneath the costume. The rest of his body is missing. I'm 20 years old, and I work at my town's local Ikea in Texas. Since I went to school during daytime, my boss put me on an overnight shift after the store closed at 11 p.m. This means I was working from 11 to roughly about 1 a.m. I was basically a janitor, going around the store, mopping the floor, and cleaning and tidying whatever people use to touch or sit around in the furniture. Given that IKEA was a super center, there would still be a number of employees working during after hours, but for some reason that night, I was one of only two other people going around the store to clean. It was around midnight, and I was dusting off some of the shelves in one of the concept living rooms when I heard someone's footsteps echoing in the distance behind me. This was odd as the store was closed over an hour ago, and no one was supposed to still be in the store's premises. I brushed it off as it was probably my coworker Carlos going around and doing his part, though it would be somewhat unusual for him to do that, given that we basically never see each other while we're cleaning, because the store is so big, and we're assigned to clean our own areas of the store each time. I brushed it off, and some time passed, I had eventually made my way to the children's bed section of the store. It wasn't my favorite part of the store, because it always was badly lit from the broken lamps overhead. I was making the beds when I noticed movement in the far corner of my vision. It was faint, like something ducking under one of the beds. I started to get pretty anxious by this point because I had just remembered the footsteps from earlier and connected the dots. Something was definitely off, and I realized that there's a high chance I'm not alone in this part of the store. I looked around, but obviously nothing. As much as I had my suspicions, I started to wonder if my mind just made up what I saw. A couple of minutes passed, and I was still very much on guard. That's when I heard a plastic cup hit the floor about a block away. It came from one of the kitchen rooms in the kitchen section, which was the last section I had to clean before I was done for the night. I stopped what I was doing and looked in the direction of the sound. All I saw was a cup in the middle of the alleyway. That made it real. My fight or flight started kicking in pretty intensely at this point as I tried to make sense of what was going on. I started to think someone was messing with me. Either my coworker or some random kids were playing some sort of prank to scare me. However, my coworker, Carlos, isn't the type to joke around, and we barely talk either way. Though I figured whoever was doing this was trying to lure me in towards the cup. I decided to call out Carlos's name. Nothing. I told him if it was a prank, he should stop right now. During that moment, I was almost practically sure it was a joke and walked towards the cup to pick it up. 
Once I was there though, I noticed that one of the cupboards underneath the sink from the concept kitchen was slightly left open. My imagination was running wild at this point, so I slowly walked towards the cupboard and opened it completely to see if anyone was inside. That's when I saw a sickly looking man staring right at me. I immediately backed off a couple of feet away and he was still staring right at me with these creepy wide eyes and a sickly smile. He wasn't saying anything, just making very creepy eye contact with me, which was probably the scariest part. After about five long traumatizing seconds of this, I was creeped out enough and I ran to the nearest exit as fast as I could, leaving all my cleaning equipment behind. I went home and tried my best to forget about what just happened, but I couldn't get the image of this creepy face out of my head. The next day, I called my boss to tell him what happened last night, and he was obviously taken aback and told me he was going to check that area for signs of someone. He called me back later in the day to tell me that they found crumbs of chips and cinnamon roll boxes in that cupboard, but nothing else. Ever since, I've kept working there, and we never again found traces of anyone living in the store. Even though I'm over it now, and come to realize it was probably a homeless man, I still can't get that haunting image of his creepy face out of my head nor can I make sense of that cup falling over for no reason. I grew up in an affluent suburb on Long Island. My parents always took care of me, and I was lucky to lead such a great life, starting early. Nothing ever extremely terrible happened to us as a family. No sudden deaths, no money problems, and my sister and I usually got everything that we wanted. I was a lucky kid to say the least. One day, the family took a day trip out to Ikea. I must have been about eight or nine. I forget what we were buying, but I remember it was large and it required some assembly. One of those items that you purchased and had to pick up the box in a different area of the store. My sister and my mother went to get the car while my father and myself went to pick up the large item from the back. It was a particularly busy day. There were a lot of people, and workers seemed overwhelmed. My dad and I waited our turn for our number to be called on a couch located in the back of the room. There were TVs to watch. I think one of them had Nickelodeon on, so I didn't mind the wait. Finally, our number was called, and my dad told me to wait on the couch while he picked up the box and brought it back over. Something happened as soon as he got to the counter because he ended up waiting longer than he thought he should. As my dad left for the counter, I noticed two Hispanic men standing off to the side, just staring at me. As soon as they saw me looking at them, one came over. He was nervous, kept checking back to his friend for approval. Finally, he reached me and asked in a shaky voice, Is anyone sitting here? I simply replied, My dad, but he's up at the counter now. And the man sat down. I was a tall child, maybe 5'6 by the time I was in 6th grade. The legs of my pants never fit, they were always too short. My sister and I had this thing about collecting funny socks. So we all had different kinds with all different patterns. Each time we went shopping, we would beg our mom for a new pair or two to add to the collection. They would stick out of the bottoms of our pants for the world to see. I distinctly remember sitting as far away from the man as I physically could on the couch, jammed up against the arm. I was focusing so hard on the TV and trying to ignore him. He finally piped up. I really like those socks. Where did you get them? He spotted my socks. I remember they said, I love cats, with the picture of a cat on them. From Coles, I replied, trying with all my might not to have a conversation with this man. He inched closer on the couch, trying to put his arms around me. Why don't you come with me and my friend? We have fun toys for you to play with. 
I froze. I turned towards him. He had this nervous smile. I looked for my dad, still standing at the corner, waiting for the desk or whatever we bought that day. I knew that everything about this was wrong. I immediately jumped up and ran to my dad, pulling at his hand to let him know that I was next to him. This all happened in a matter of minutes, and to this day, it is still as traumatizing as it was 12 years ago. I burned the socks and haven't set foot in an Ikea since. All I could think about is what would have happened to me that day. I'm glad 8-year-old me had the sense not to go with the creep.